Welcome to CTI Online. I'm Holly Batista. My husband and I are the lead pastors here at CTI, and we are so happy that you're here with us. CTI is here to help you find and follow Jesus. So no matter where you are or what you're going through, we pray that this message has something special for you. I encourage you to receive whatever God has in store for you today. Today we're in week three of our series, uh, The Story of the Sower, and today we're going to look at yet another response to the message of Christ. Remember this parable that Jesus told, it's the, the same seed or the same message, right, that's sown into our lives, it's the word of God, but each soil that it lands on responds differently. And so we've looked first at the seed that fell on the path a couple weeks back, and that represents that hard, unresponsive responsive heart. Last week, if you were with us, we talked about the seed that fell on the shallow soil, right? And we looked at how that soil that was too shallow, it could not accommodate a root system. And without roots, whatever does end up growing and breaking through the surface in your life, it's not going to last very long because storms, right? The storms that we experience in this life, they're inevitable. Well, today we're going to be looking at the third type. Why don't you stand again? I know we're kind of playing the stand-up, sit-down game today, um, but it's good. Cardio is good for you. Get that blood flowing this morning, and we're going to be in Matthew chapter 13 again today. We're going to start in verse 3 through 9, and we're going to skip down to verse 22. Then he, being Jesus, told them many things in parables, saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Look at verse 7. This is where we'll be today. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked out the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Skip down quickly to verse 22. Jesus said, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. Would you bow your heads with me again? Lord, speak to us now through the preaching of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Today I'm calling this message, Don't Choke. Turn to your neighbor and say, Don't Choke. Turn to your other neighbor and say, You either. If you happen to be an avid gardener, any avid gardeners in the house today? Okay, we got some in the house today. <laughs> Better you than me, bro. Okay, I am not the avid gardener. But if you are an avid gardener, you would know that perhaps the biggest enemy to your garden are weeds that are growing there, right? And before we discuss why weeds are significant to this story that Jesus told, let's just stop here for a minute and can we just identify that this is really what this whole entire parable is about. It's about being fruitful. And next week, when we wrap all of this up, we're going to look at the fourth and the final type of soil, and we're going to be looking at the good soil or the healthy soil. We'll see why this is so crucial. But the whole point of this story is that Jesus, what has he given us? He's given us his word. He's given us this life-changing message. He's given us his salvation. And when we receive it, when we take it in, it should then produce fruit in us that should be evident on the outside of us. And in order for us to be fruitful, in order for you to be effective, in order for you and me, right, if we want to fulfill our kingdom purpose as followers of Christ, we have to make sure that we tend to the soil of our heart. Preparation is one of the most important parts of gardening. If something is going to grow, that soil has to be prepared. If it's hard, it needs to be broken up. If it's dry, what does it need? It needs to be watered. If it's unhealthy, then it needs to be fertilized. If it's rocky, it needs to be sifted, and those rocks need to be removed. Gardening 
It takes a lot of preparation. It's hard. It's dirty. It involves being outdoors. Those are all the reasons why I don't want to be a part of it. But I think that sometimes we place so much emphasis on the preparation, what needs to be done in advance, that maybe, perhaps, we underplay the reality, right, that gardening also requires continual maintenance. And don't get me wrong, the preparation part, the beginning part of that soil to plant, that's arguably the most important part. Nothing's going to grow if we don't make sure that the environment that we plant in is healthy. But we would be severely mistaken to believe that once that seed goes into the ground, the job is finished. That's just not how it works. You see, the continual maintenance and the care of that seed is huge because once that seed goes into the ground, believing that it went into healthy soil, ground that was rich, ground that was ready to receive, it's our responsibility to make sure that we keep it that way. And when it comes to the weeds that Jesus speaks of, we need to listen closely to what he said, and we really need to understand the dangers that exist here in this area. We read it a moment ago in verse 7. It said, other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. You see, it's pretty simple. What we just read, it's like about a 12-word sentence, right? It's not hard, but the implications, they're massive, Jesus is saying that this seed that fell on the soil that was healthy enough, right? It was healthy enough to allow the plant to grow. Well, Jesus didn't actually say that, but we can conclude that from what we just read by the sheer fact that there was growth in that soil. And if there's growth in the soil, that's a good thing, but the complications came from other things that were also growing in the same soil. It was the thorns, or we could call them weeds. And because these thorns or these weeds were growing there in the same soil that that seed was planted in, because they were sharing soil, they both kept growing until eventually the plant from the seed was choked out by the rapid growth of the weeds. Are you seeing where we're going with this? We need to heed this warning here, and we need to pay close attention not just to the seed that's growing in the soil, but we also better be vigilant about what else might be growing in our soil, because it's not just about adding Jesus into the mix of our life, which is what many people, they mistakenly believe when they come to a place of faith in Christ. When we treat Jesus like he's some kind of missing ingredient and we just try to stir him in and incorporate him into our lives that are already filled with other things. The problem is what we're doing. We're creating competition. And this is really what weeds do in a garden. Weeds compete. You see, the seed that's embedded in the soil, that's going to put down roots. We talked about that, right? Last week, the importance of a root system. And this is where that plant is going to derive and receive all of those healthy nutrients from. The roots are where that plant drinks from. It's where that plant eats from. It's where that plant receives from. But the problem is the weeds that exist in that same soil Guess what they're trying to do? They're trying to drink. They're trying to eat. They're trying to receive all at the same time. And weeds, weeds are aggressive in their growth. How many know, how many know that's the truth, right? And so what ends up happening is that they're competing for those nutrients, for that same healthy nutrient in that soil that that plant needs to grow. And so Jesus, he explains what the weeds or the thorns are in his explanation of this parable. And I just want to read it from Mark's gospel. We're going to switch it up and, and move over to Mark, who told the same story. And in Mark chapter 4, verses 18 through 19, listen to what Jesus says, how Mark records it. He says, still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word and count these things with me. But the worries of this life, 
the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. And so he calls out these things specifically. He says the worries of this life the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires that we have for other things. He says, Jesus is saying, these are the weeds that will compete with what I desire to do, with what I desire to grow in your life. Interesting to me that Jesus, he talks about worries, he talks about wealth, and he talks about wants. Worries, wealth, and wants. And he refers to these things as the thorns or the weeds. These are all the things, right? We're well acquainted with all of these things. And listen, I don't need to define this or explain this. We understand them conceptually. But perhaps you and I, we don't realize how much of our time, how much of our attention, how much of our energy is sucked up in all of these issues. And that's what we're talking about here. There's a competition for your time, your attention, and for your energy. Maybe you didn't know that this morning. I want to tell you again, right here, right now, there is a competition for your time, for your attention, and for your energy. And if you want to be spiritually fruitful, and I believe in my heart that many of us do, And if we want God's word to take root in our life, and if we want God's plan to flourish in us, and I believe that many of us here do, the majority of our time, our attention, and our energy should be invested in him. But more often than not, our time, our attention, and our energy, what do we invest them in? Into the worries, the wealth, and to the wants. Think about it. How much of your day, how much of your day, how much of my day is devoted to the Lord? How much of your daily time is devoted to fulfilling your kingdom purpose? How much of your day is devoted or reserved or blocked off on your calendar to feed on this word of God that is the daily bread? And contrast that time with how much of our day is devoted to all of our responsibilities and the worries of this life. You see, the worries of this life, it's not just the stuff that you and I worry about because some of us heard that and we thought, oh, I don't really worry about a lot of things. I don't really have a lot of anxiety. Or some of you thought, I do have a lot of anxiety. I do have a lot of worries. But it's not just things that we're worried about. It's the worries of this life. I believe what's being referred to here is more of the busyness of the things that we have to do just to live at the pace that we're told we have to live. We spend more time trying to be productive than we invest in being spiritually fruitful. And that's just the truth of the matter. I'm I'm guilty of that too this morning. And all of the cares and, and all of the worries of this life, oftentimes they get the best of us. They get the best of our attention. And you know what God gets? He gets the little that we have left over if he gets anything at all. What about wealth when it comes to wealth? Well, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not a greedy person. I don't, I don't struggle. I don't have money issues. Our finances... Our money, this is one of the biggest weeds that we all have to deal with, especially in America. I don't even know if you and I fully realize how materialistic the world that we live in is and how much that rubs off on us, having the latest and the greatest, the biggest and the best. We got to keep up with the Joneses. That's what a lot of us are doing, scrolling through social media. We're looking at what everybody else has. And when we finally close out that app, it leaves us feeling less than because what we just did was compared what somebody else has to what we have. Jesus calls it the deceitfulness of wealth. Why? Because this competes for our heart's affection in such a deceptive way too. And it has a way of consuming us. Like we, 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 can't, we can't get enough of it. Some of us, some people in this world, they have more investments in the stock market than we have in the kingdom of God. We sow more seeds into stuff than we sow into the storehouse. We like to buy new toys, right? But when Pastor Dan talked about tithing a moment ago, we all got tensed up. Why? Because of the deception of wealth that says you don't have enough. You better hold on to what you have. You need more. 
Don't let anybody, don't give any of that away. And don't forget the wants, right? The desires for other things. What is Jesus talking about here? I believe what Jesus is talking about here is just simply our own plans. And listen, we've talked about this a lot before. It's not bad. It's not bad to have a plan. You should have a plan. It's smart. It's prudent to have a plan. But sometimes our plans and our dreams are different than what God has for us. And sometimes we can be pursuing all of the things that we have planned for us and we forget that God has a plan for us. These are the things that suck the life out of what God wants to do in us and through us and the growth that he wants to bring for us spiritually. When all of our time, all of our attention, all of our energy is given to these weeds, guess what's going to happen? It's not rocket science. The weeds are going to grow because we're feeding them. And as these weeds begin to grow in that soil, like all other things that grow, they get larger and larger. And the larger that they get in the garden bed that they take up, the more room, more space, more area. Before you know it, there's no room for anything else to grow. And this is another thing that weeds do. What weeds do is they crowd out. And how many know that when a garden becomes overcrowded, especially with weeds that have sprouted up there, it's not going to be long until the plant life begins to suffer and die. Why? Because those weeds are dominating the soil. They're choking out the possibility for anything else to thrive or to flourish. And this is the plan of the enemy for every one of our lives. The enemy would love for our lives to become so overcrowded with stuff, with the wrong stuff, with the weeds of this life, that there's no more room for the gospel to grow inside of us. When you and I, when we become preoccupied, when our heart becomes divided so many different ways by so many other things, there's no more space for God to move. There's no more area for him to occupy within us. And this is what many people find when they come to Christ. They very quickly realize the cost of following Jesus. Because what it really comes down to is in order to follow God, in order to have what he wants in my life, in order to make sure that I'm pursuing his will, I got to give him enough room to work with. Some of us, and I say this to you in love, some of us have allowed our lives to become so overcrowded with so many other things that what God wants to grow in you, the new thing that God wants to deposit in your life, the breakthrough, the breakthrough that you've been praying for, it's not that he can't do it, he can do anything. It's not that he doesn't want to do it, it is his will that you walk and break through. But it's that you haven't saved any, you haven't reserved a seat, you haven't blocked off, we don't block off the room. For him to come and move, instead we let all of those other things crowded out. Listen, we can't have our plan and God's plan at the same time. We can't pursue our dreams and ask God to give us his dream for our life simultaneously. We have to be reminded that when it comes to the territory that God occupies, when it comes to the soil that God's word is deposited into, he doesn't share space. He doesn't. You know, the Bible talks about God. It talks about the love of God. And it says that the love of God is jealous for us, meaning he wants all of us. And sometimes, right, when we hear that, we think of the sin jealousy, right? You, usually jealousy, it's a negative attribute. But, but it's really not when it comes to God because the reason that God wants all of you is because he gave all of himself up for you. He laid down his life for you. He died on a cross for you. He had to get real serious about the price that he was going to pay just for you to experience salvation. And so when it comes to us opening up our heart to receive him, he's not looking for an itty bitty corner of your garden. 
He's not looking for a little tiny portion of your soil. He wants it all. He wants all of you. He wants you to make room for him to have every part of you, heart, soul, mind, and strength. But, right, what we'll often do is we will attempt to have this growing, thriving relationship with him. We'll attempt to have a a growing hunger for his word while at the same time allowing all of this other junk to grow around that. And we'll wonder, we'll scratch our heads sometimes And we'll wonder why we can never get past a certain point in our relationship with him. It's because we're trying to allow his word to grow in us. But we're also allowing that toxic relationship to grow at the same time. We'll hold on to pain and to hurt from the past of what they said to us, of what they spoke over us, of how they abandoned us. And we'll never truly deal with the root. And we'll allow unforgiveness to grow right alongside of this new relationship that we have with Jesus. We'll allow bitterness to occupy the flower bed, the garden bed. We'll hold on to old habits and old thought patterns and mindsets and attitudes. And all of these things will continue to grow like weeds in our heart, like the thorns. They start to wrap themselves around all of the other plant life. And before you know it, it's choking out all of the life of your relationship with God. And I don't know if you've noticed, but weeds, they like grow like overnight. Like one day they're not there, and then the next day they're there. It doesn't take long for them to take over everything. And there's no space left for anything else. This is why every gardener who knows the first thing about gardening, which I don't, right? But they know that the process of weeding Hear me, the process of weeding is not something that you do one time. You see, now I'm talking, I'm talking to the believers in the room who've been walking with Jesus for a long time. You don't just weed one time. It's something you have to regularly do. You see, weeding, it's part of the preparation for the soil in the beginning, yeah. But it's also part of the daily maintenance to make sure that there's nothing that's going to come and infringe on the space where those plants are going to bloom and flourish. Weeds have to be cut out. You got to cut them out. You got to rip them out. You got to get them from the roots. Because if you don't get them from the root, then you're not even solving the problem. You're just making the top look nice. In the process of weeding, it's tedious. It's time-consuming. And it's continual. But it's necessary in order to maintain that space that's needed for the healthy things to grow. How many people want the healthy things to grow? Make no mistake, whatever weeds you choose to tolerate, yeah, no big deal. (laughs) Whatever weeds you choose to tolerate and to not completely cut out, the ones that you leave behind and never really address, those are going to be the weeds that completely sabotage the rest of your garden. And I think sometimes we misrepresent this. A lot of times we think that the things that are crowding out what God wants to do in our lives are are sin issues. But can I tell you today, I don't think that that's all that it is. Of course, if you have sin that is unresolved in your heart or that's still ruling your life, that's definitely going to impede on a fruitful relationship with Christ. But what else? I think that oftentimes we overlook the fact that sometimes the weeds in our garden can be good things or non-sin things that we've just given way too much space over to. I love what the writer of Hebrews says 
in Hebrews chapter 12, verses one through two, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, listen, let us strip off every weight, somebody say weight, that slows us down, especially the sin, somebody say sin, that so easily trips us up and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. You see, I memorized this verse of scripture when I was a kid growing up here at Calvary Temple. It stood with me all my life. And I knew it and I memorized it. I think one time I quoted it for a leader to get a piece of candy. But the more and more that I meditate on it, God starts to show you things when you meditate on his word. And I know that you might be thinking this verse has nothing to do with our gardening theme, but stay with me. I'm going to connect the dots for you because there's a truth here that I really believe we need to take away today. You see, he's talking about the things that we need to get rid of or strip off, right? You could also say the things that we need to weed out or uproot in order for God to grow us in the direction that he wants us to grow in. But he makes a distinction here about the weights that are things that slow us down and the sin that trips us up. Or when I memorized it as a kid, the sin that so easily entangles or ensnares. He says that we need to strip off both the weights and the sins because, because both of these things hinder our growth. Now, we know what a sin is, right? We don't have to define that. But, but what are the weights? You see, a weight is something that isn't necessarily wrong, but something that might not be beneficial. There are weights or weeds that might not be overtly wrong or sinful, but may not be beneficial to you either. You see where I'm going with this? All right, give me an example. All right, I will. For some of us, it might be a friendship or a relationship. It might not be a bad friendship. It might not be a bad relationship, but it might not be producing fruit that's consistent with what God has for you. It might not be helping you grow. It might not be pushing you forward in your walk with the Lord. And maybe it's become a weight that's held you back and stunted your growth. For some, it could be our comfort zone. Let me tell you, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing sinful about your comfort zone. We all have one. But your comfort zone doesn't promote growth. It's going to hold you back from things. It could be tradition. There's nothing sinful about tradition, right? But maybe those traditions, they've started to infringe on what God has for you next. And those traditions, they've, they've limited your outlook or your perspective of how God could use you or what God wants to do in you. They become these rigid lines that you say you need to stay on the inside of. You need to, God needs to work within that. God doesn't need to work within the confines of your tradition. And that could be something that's taking up too much space in your life. Maybe it's taking up too much space in your ministry or your mindset. Let me explain it this way. Listen, a weight can be a good thing that is no longer a God thing. You hear me? A weight could be a good thing that is no longer a God thing. And when it comes to what can stay, and when it comes to what has to go in our garden, if we take the approach of allowing things to stay in that soil that aren't necessarily wrong or sinful, but at the same time are, are no longer beneficial, what ends up happening is that what God wants to do in us actually gets choked out by those things that they started off harmless. They, they weren't bad, they, they weren't sin issues but we gave all of our space to those things and they ended up crowding him out and competing with what he wanted to do. And that's why we have to uproot. That's why we have to cut out not just the sin, but also the weights, the hindrances, the distractions, the weeds that take up too much space that he wants to occupy. What are you saying? Get to the point. I know. 
I can read your face. Are you saying that we can't have anything that we enjoy in life? Are you saying that, that God, doesn't, God doesn't want me to have nice things? Are you saying that I have to get rid of everything that brings me joy? Psh, that's not who God is. It's not what I'm saying at all. But what I am saying is that sometimes the things that got you and me to this point that we're currently at, they may not be able to come with us into the next season of growth. And if you and I want to keep on growing, and if you and I want what God is about to do in this house, in our lives, in our marriages, in our families, then sometimes we got to get down on our hands and our knees. And we have to put in the hard work, and we have to uproot, and we have to cut away, and we have to do the weeding out of the things that are taking up space that God desires to occupy. Because if you don't do that, those weeds, definitely the sin things, but even the good things that are no longer God things, they will choke the life out of what God desires to do in you. Would you stand? Thank you for being a part of the CTI online family. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel so you'll be the first to know when we go live or share new content. Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments about how this message has blessed you or if there's any way that we can pray for you. We so appreciate your time and we hope to see you again soon.